C. Oh, railroad, oil, steel, electricity, and Calhoun. And Calhoun, yes. Calhoun. And chemical, right? <laughs> and let's just jump right in. We got all the acre. Do you think any of this at all? Yeah, yeah everyone had the whole electric dynamo. The problem with that was so on the direct line, the electricity would just bleed out, especially the first time they used steel cable. That's why copper would some be such a big deal. That's why view would have 120,000 people in 1919, which is so weird to think about today. Especially go to parts of downtown and have people living there in 70 years. And but the alternating current's a little bit different. Have you ever seen? Or the electricity did not bleed away, but it's significantly more dangerous. Instead of just one line from the power source to the light bulb, let's say. It is two lines. You ever seen a core where it has two lines? That's because it's making a loop. And so you have, here's the power source, and what is the power source? Magnets. Gerbil turning a magnet, right? That's a gerbil. The gerbil of capital. But going to, here's the light bulb. So, smiley face light bulb. So that's pretty good, isn't it? Can you see it over there? Oh, thank goodness. So with that, what happens is instead of one straight continuous flow of electricity that bleeds out, it goes one shot of electricity that makes the loop like this. And then here, just back and forth, just quick little bursts of electricity. But it's almost simultaneous, so it's almost a constant flow of electricity. So what happens is when you flip a switch, what you're doing is you're connecting the two wires and electricity starts to flow. You turn the switch off and you no electricity flows. But the thing about this is because it's short burst, not as much electricity bleeds out, and therefore you could have the dynamo far away. And that would allow for like Westinghouse dynamo to become bigger and produce electricity for a lot of different homes or businesses or whatever it might be. It still will leak away. Has anyone ever stood under a one of those um, high tension power lines? The ones having thousands of watts going through, you almost can feel that the Vibration going through that's the electricity bleeding out. Stand it there for a few days, it'll change your life. <laughs> Don't do that. And if you do, remember, remember who told you to do it? Mr. Larson. Mr. Larson, yes. But that's a pretty light bulb. So, with that, now Edison, did I show you Topsy then? Edison to prove that alternating current was really dangerous because the problem is this if it's one continuous line, and if you connect the two wires, you have electricity going through, that could be really dangerous. If let's say what's connecting the two lines is your tongue. You get electrocuted. That's why if you stick a fork into, don't do this again, into a power outlet, you're connecting the two ends, and that's why you get electrocuted. Then you, the power goes through you. So you just become part of the loop. That's why you can, yeah, stick a fork in a power outlet and pull a light bulb. It's really cool. Once again, don't do that. All right. So Edison, to prove and what he wanted everyone to have a dynamo, he, well, there was an elephant that was condemned for murder named Topsy. And he volunteered to kill Topsy. And that's what he did. Here's Topsy being wired up to alternating current, and they electrocuted the elephant. And I'm not kidding. Topsy was condemned to die because he was a circus elephant, and he was upset in his cage, and the elephants, it depends what the circus is, all that, but he, what, they can be treated pretty poorly and kill this animal. So naturally, what do you do when an elephant commits murder? You put him on trial, which they had a trial, I'm not making that up, and they condemn Topsy to death. Because as we all know, that will, without a doubt, deter other elephant-related crimes. When elephants hear about Topsy doing that, you think an elephant's going to commit murder again? Look what happened to Topsy. That's how justice works. Okay, that's my way of saying, isn't that just unbelievable? But they actually did, he murdered an elephant. And other animals, too, to show how dangerous it was. But still, it's much more efficient. That's the beginnings of electrocution. Yes, you can go on YouTube, and some of the film was there, because Edison, who invented the motion picture camera, filmed this. You can watch them kill an elephant. 
I, it's, I like elephants, so I try to find it very disgusting, but alternating current is going to come out because it's much more efficient. And George Westinghouse company, he started with air brakes, which you can imagine would be a really big deal for trains, would eventually come up with, or his company, with a dynamo, you know, this is alternating current, the alternating system, that could be used for a large power plant. You get a bank of these, you might have to find something that will turn the magnet, but will produce alternating current. And Westinghouse invention would pretty much make sure that everybody having a little dynamo would go out of business, but that wouldn't work. Ironically, Tesla, who in many ways would be responsible for alternating current, got none of the credit, none of the money. And Edison actually invested in this company. So I guess in a way he eh, fits in with the kind of person Edison was. He got the last lap on that one. Tesla, then there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about that. There's Westinghouse. So what of Edison? Edison, we know as the Wizard of Menlo Park. This is New Jersey. He had his lap there. He didn't invent most of the things he would take credit for. But what Edison did is, Edison had all the inventors working there sign a contract saying he would get the credit, a.k.a. the patent for whatever was built at Menlo Park. But that's the way most inventions are done today. People do it, and then whoever hired whatever corporation, that's usually what it is, they get the patent. They get the money from it. And so Menlo Park, New Jersey. Give me an idea of some of the things he did. The biggest one that came out of there was not so much the light bulb, but the little filament in here that when electricity runs through it, it would glow and not break. Part of the problem was it would glow and be too hot and cause a fire, or electricity would go through it and it would snap. But a filament that did not break, and therefore light bulbs would become practical. And once you have light bulbs, one cup, look at like refrigerator food, how much this would change everything. So some basic things like having light in the home, light, have lights in the streets, which makes things much safer. Companies cannot produce 24 hours a day to 12 hour shifts, just go. That's both good and bad, depending on your point of view. Think about the fire safety. Before when it was candles and oil, coal oil, or a little before that, whale oil. By the 1870s, they had killed most of the easy to kill whales. So they had the coal oil, really dangerous. The threat of fire dropped dramatically with electricity. I know it's still there, but so much more safer. But there's something else, and this is what I want you to put in the light bulbs. Light bulbs would trigger a, all kinds of electric innovation. Innovations in electricity. Once you have the light bulb, all these innovations follow. And not directly related to the light bulb. They'd be in all sorts of things. Because the thing is this. Once you had electric light, that would be an incentive for everyone to pay the extra money to get power lines from your home. Now homes have electricity for lights. Once that happened, it's like, oh, we have electricity going in homes. What else can we can we innovate that people will want to buy using the electricity they got because of lights? And so that's where you start getting all like the household appliances, like uh, the first washing machine, which was just basically a big tub and just spun. Or that you had to put water in by hand and everything else, but still, better doing it by hand in a way. And like the first vacuum cleaner. Ice boxes combined with refrigerated cars eventually miniaturized to refrigerators. So all those things that you don't even think about coming from light bulb would come because people had electricity. But so many of the innovations we have today would never have made sense if homes did not have electricity. Why would you ever invent a television or a home radio if no one had electricity? Those are all coming down the road. So that's one. Here's a couple more that connects very much with this. The photograph. That's why he invented a speaker that would go with Alexander Graham, Bowen, Graham Bell's phone. And the first one is actually you turn, you turn a little crank and basically by tension, it run a little cord and it's holding unravel to turn the photograph for about, the, about two minutes and you crank it again, eventually electricity. The first one was a wax tube. And the wax tube, they, they, a, a stylus would make grooves into it. And that's what, that, um, that's what they would read for the sound. Eventually, they would go to wax records, but wax melted. I think. So they're eventually vinyl records when I was a youth, when I 
was your age, that's what I had, vinyl records. And now they've come back in the side with all the hipsters. And so they're all getting that. And since I have all my old ones, I too am a hipster, I guess. You got to admit, pretty cool here. And no coincidence, you have this. And he called, tried to call it the antiphone, but soon it became the dictaphone. But this you could record at home with a style. You get the wax and have the stylus actually dig into the wax. Then all you have to do is shave off the wax and use it again. And they would still use these and eventually metal. Uh, metal. This is Pope Pius the Ninth using the dictaphone. I just think that's kind of cool. They were still using these into the 1970s. So if we ever listen to Lyndon Johnson or JFK take parts of their Oval Office conversations on one of these dictaphones. Richard Nixon will use tape. That's coming later. Motion picture camera, another Menlo Park invention. And once again, on the shoulders of others, and pretty soon, okay, they're filming very, just like, wow, motion pictures. But it would go from that to Edison would start reenacting historical events, and he then actually doing short stories in the motion picture capital of the world at the turn of the century, New Jersey, because that's where Menlo Park was. And they would film all sorts of things, and the first movies are coming. But it wouldn't take long until they moved movie production down here. Why move movie production here? No one likes New Jersey? No, New Jersey's fine. You know why? Weather. What's the weather like in California? Southern California, sunny, how often does it rain? Never. So if you have to film one scene over a few days, you know the sky's always going to be the same. You know, if it's all of a sudden cloudy one day, you can't film. It's money. So if you have a nice sunny day, you know what the weather's going to be. That's why whenever you make your movie, who's going to make a movie someday? If any would-be directors, don't film in snow. Snow That's That's my movie-making tip. That and use film. Next. Now, we're going away from Edison. Another invention of this era, actually it started in German, Germany, but Frederick Benz and, uh, uh, made the first car, but we're talking Henry Ford. And the reason we're putting Henry Ford for cars is not that he invented it, it wasn't, uh, Michael, or the Mike, I don't mind the age next up. Is it Frederick Daimler? He invented the internal combustion engine. But the big thing about Henry Ford is Henry Ford, by perfecting in many ways the assembly line, could produce cars that regular people could buy. And he actually did something that was unusual for the time. It shows how the economy was changing. Henry Ford realized that people, workers, are going to have to buy his cars. Railroads aren't going to buy cars. He needs workers. And so he actually paid them at first a little bit more, that's a quote for him, a little bit more than the market wage, with the idea of being able to turn around and buy Model T's. Thus, he's creating his own demand. Now, he would quit doing this by the 1920s and become one of the lowest paid workers and nearly go out of business. But that's another story. And he was a Nazi in many ways. So yeah, there's a lot of things with Henry Ford we'll get to. It's complex. But the reason I'm putting it there is, I just, you have to write this down, I just wanted to show you. This is the price in constant dollars for what cars cost. So it's $1,000, and even though inflation, $1,000 for a car, and the price dropped by over one third. Why? By making just one car and producing it over and over again. They became very efficient, the cost dropped, and therefore the price could drop and they could still make money. What do we call that when a company gets big enough that they can come up with good production techniques, become more efficient, their cost drops, and they have a competitive advantage? This is economies of scale, and it works everywhere. This is how it worked for Ford and every other, all the little car companies that were literally making them by hand, where do they go? Gone. Only the big can compete. So we're coming to that, but I just wanted to put that in there just to remind you. Another big innovation, 1903, the first airplane. 
And there have been a lot of people working on it, but the Wright brothers from Ohio, they were by typical repairmen. We're not going to go into all the details of this. Obviously, like tomorrow, we'll come back to it. But it fits right into that second industrial revolution. And they flew this in 1903 in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. Why North Carolina? Anyone know? <coughs> Combination, long flat beaches and really windy. So planes to take off, it, the best case scenario is to go into the wind. And the wind blowing over the wind, the wings will give them that lift. And so like aircraft carriers will turn into the wind. <laughs> and so they did the first one. Now the French would actually pass the US because the Wright brothers turned out to not really want to share their invention with other people. So there was a lot of plane development, but another example of innovation really took off in this era. And obviously you don't need to know all of these, but we have everything from skyscrapers to transformers. I didn't even put down elevators. I mean, there's so many things that go into this. The first subway in Britain in the United States, and those needed electric motors because I think you can see the problem of running a steam engine in a tunnel. You can understand that, that whole, you know, you might kill the passengers. That's bad for business, they won't ride again. And this is an actual patent from the U.S. Patent Office in 1895. Someone's making its own flying machine. That's the real deal. Got a patent for that. But since that patent is now open, I've decided, command decision, you can do that for your extra We'll go up on the roof. And we'll, let's see what we have. You know, somebody would complain. One of you people would tell on Mr. Larson, wouldn't you? One of you people would. So with that, you get all kinds of things. With the radio, but it's still be 20 years for it actually to be really workable. You know, just these big, massive things. But heck, they had the first transcontinental railroad transmission by 1901. That's actually remarkable. Transatlantic. And everything from barbed wire, denim, mail order catalogs. Etc. going on here. And the thing is we got to get to is one of the things that was meant to encourage innovation. What happens if you innovate and come up with, 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 a, with a great invention? You could submit it to what? And therefore have a monopoly, at least for a while, on selling it, thus encouraging more innovation. What do you have to do? I already said it. What was this? A patent. And the Patent Office in the United States, which was created back in the founding of the United States under this Constitution, would give whoever created that a monopoly, depending on what it is, you know, six, six slash 12 years for pharmaceuticals, 100 years now for some intellectual property, where they get a monopoly. And the whole idea is, if you have a monopoly on the sale of whatever your invention might be, that will encourage more invention, because you're going to make money off it. And very few patents, but these are the number of patents by decade and not most inventions actually never get a patent. But look how they increase per decade. In fact, so many patents were issued in 1900 that the head of the patents office predicted there will be no more patents. Everything that can be invented has been invented. He was slightly off and he was right. Yeah, we're stuck in 1900. And the first decade of the 2000s is 1.9 million patents in the first decade. It's going to be probably over 2 million this decade. And yes, it does encourage innovation. And a lot of people who try to get a patent and they can get rich. But the big thing you've got to get is this. This is a government monopoly. The gov I'm sorry, the government gives a monopoly. The government enforces a monopoly. Well, that's a pretty good business. You come up with a patent on something that people need, and then you have a monopoly protected by the United States government, meaning the police and the court system, what can you charge? If people want it, and if you have no moral scruples, you can charge anything you want. And so this will become a way to actually use it, to use monopolies to get rich. If you know anything about the pharmaceutical industry, you know what I'm talking about. Will they charge, okay, what's the hep hepatitis C drug, Solidaro, you know, they come up with those fake science names or market them, but it costs about $100 for you to make about a year's worth of that medication. You know what they charge? Huh? Over a thousand. Oh, Over a hundred thousand for a year. Why? Because they have a patent. And so they'll let people die. 
two times and stuff. Stupid as that's Yeah, can't Yeah, India has no patents, so they sort of hundred each. Yeah, a hundred bucks or something that would cost five thousand. And that's one thing you have to try and do to make, get rid of that so they don't charge that much money. And so that's the thing about patents. And I'll give you another thing. There's also most of the patents that take money here is my iPhone. I think it's like, I have no idea what that is. iPhone 58.8. And you see this right here? Pat, Apple patented that curved edge. So any cell phone that uses a curved edge, they suit. And violating our patent. Almost all the patents today are about that. Little things that try to get people to drive so they get a monopoly. You know, if you turn your phone off or on, you have a little sliding thing, they patent it off. Why? The gouge. Just the gouge, gouge, gouge. So I have, I have some issues with patent laws, but that's the way it happens. So there's good and bad things about them. So, hey, one of the big factors in railroads. And we've already talked about railroads. Remember the first industrial revolution went through all the things that rail use a bill of railroad goes to steel, iron, coal, every industry in the world. But railroads were key. Railroads themselves were an industry. Railroads were required to build railroads. Because you had to get the goods to market. Here's taking ore to market. And look at the infrastructure just for there to make that bridge. And I think you see the problem with that trestle bridge. Fire. That you need better bridges and still engineering that goes on and on or constantly has to be repaired. But that does look rickety, doesn't it? Scary. So, one of the ways railroads did it was this was a perfect combination of government aid and business. Government aid, massive government aid. Here's another picture of what I've already showed you once before all the land grants given to railroads. But here's what you got to get about government aid and railroads. It's not just money to the railroads. Government aid to build railroads is also, therefore, indirectly government aid for the coal industry, for the iron industry, for the steel industry, or leather, wood, for everything. Aid for railroads can ripple to all parts of the economy. Just like today, the U.S. government builds roads. Money to build roads will ripple to all parts of the economy, and not just the workers who build the roads, but also to pay for all the equipment to build it, but also every business then that can use the taxpayer-funded roads to ship their goods. It ripples everywhere. So this is direct aid, but it can't ripple at all. Everyone got that. And the word you have to get is this. Two words, I'm sorry. This is what they call the multiplier effect. For every it multiplier effect. For every one dollar the government spends on a thing like railroads, can be two or three times more money in the economy. Because it leads to everything from buying the iron to the workers going out to eat. They spend more money. That's how government aid works. Same thing with railroads, or for that matter, something like uh, uh, food stamps or unemployment insurance. That's the same effect. So, click, click. And here is a Civil War era train, but I just wanted to get back with a 10 engine and America, 10 wheeled American. But let's jump right to here. 1870. So I showed you a map like this before, but just to give you an idea of how much was built in this era. So think about how much iron and coal and everything else needed. 1870, just the major routes. 1890. That's just 20 years. Look at Iowa. Those are just major routes. That's not all the railroad. So that's going to ripple to everything. And what this means is the railroads are going to demand almost all of the goods produced in the United States. Up until the teens of the 20th century, our economy was, de was uh, dominated by what we call producer demand. Producer demand. Producer demand means industry. Industry demanded most of the goods produced. What's the industry? The railroad industry. So producer means once built. The railroads demanded most industrial goods. So all the steel production, or almost all, with the railroads. They fueled the economy. Now, eventually, 
producer demand won't be enough. What fuels the economy now that became to dominate after 1920, after World War I, to this day? What kind of demand? Not producer demand. What kind of demand? Consumer demand. And that's a big shift. Consumer demand, those are the workers. Those are most people. That's us. And it went from the railroads need money to the workers need money. And if the workers don't have money, they don't buy. If they don't buy, companies shut their doors. Like in 1929. Or 2008. So, yeah, the worst economic crash in American history since the Great Depression. You were alive. I did not know that. No, you do. Thank you. So, and we, we just came out of it about four years ago. Maybe. I think we got a few. But, no, there's no sign of it now. Not for, no, we got it. But, I'd say, the soon as it could happen, we'll be Probably more like 13 months ago. <laughs> but there's no, like, there, there, there has been, there's not a problem, really. So, but, all the things are in place. So with that, we have a real marriage of government and business. In fact, that's where you get Gilded Age politics, where business and government are to become intertwined, and the interest of business will directly affect the interest of government. And remember this term, laissez-faire. We talked about this before. But what's coming out of this, we mentioned this once before in the early Industrial Revolution, it's the government's not going to mess with competition. That's the laissez-faire. Companies can compete however they want, and if they want to drive other companies out of business, which they all do, however they do, it's fine. Yet there'll be massive government aid for railroads, and for some reason I forgot the percent parentheses there, but that's the way railroads work. Always cutting corners. And this, so laws I fair, it's not really laws I fair. There's massive government aid. And of course the railroads are all going to say, we did it all on our own. Remember that myth of the individual I talked about. But coming back to economies of scale. Because of economies of scale, if government, if no one is going to deal with competition, yet there's going to be aid for mostly big business. And because of economies of scale, what kind of companies, what kind of business would this help? Big. And that's what we got to get down to. This is direct aid for big businesses. This is direct aid. Because of economies of scale, big business has an advantage. If you're going to do nothing about the size of companies, all that's going to happen is the big will win and swallow up the small. Always. Always, always, always. There's never been a time where that is not happening. Capitalism, I know capitalism has been around all that long, less than 200 years. But still, that's it. And so what you're going to have is the bigger becoming more and more bigger, more and more dominant, small going out of business. And will small business be allowed to get in the market? No, because they can't compete. So bigger and bigger. Now, I told you this once before. We're going to the 20th century, they have the name for liberal or conservative economics. So this era, would it be liberal or conservative economics? Conservative. This is the definition of concern. So what is the government? So much of economic economic uh, policy is based on the president of the United States. So president now, President Trump, is a conservative or liberal? Yeah, probably the most conservative president we've had in year. Maybe the most conservative president ever. President Trump. It's just, I mean, it's all for big business. It's all going to be. Very conscious. So that's where we are today. And here's John D. Rockefeller, Standard Oil, and you see the what he's doing, peering into what building is that? That's the White House. And you notice giving them money, basically controlling the president. And I like how they put smoke stacks on the Capitol. I think that's kind of clever. But who's running things? And some of the things are a tariff. High protective tariff, that's a tax on what? 
Yeah, imported goods. Who pays that tax, by the way? Consumers. So what it was are massive taxes on imports. What that did is that did things like drive out still competition. Foreign competition is gone because they could that allowed for people like Carnegie to conquer the steel market. But once foreign competition is gone, and companies like the steel company or whatever the company might be might be in the US begins to dominate, that allows them to raise prices above the market. That's why I crossed out free market, even though it's never been really a free market, but the market no longer decides in a tariff. Tariffs allow companies to raise all prices because their competitors have to pay a higher price because of the tax. That means who pays a higher price? Consumers pay more, either they pay a tax or they pay higher prices. And who gets the profits from the higher prices? Who gets profits in a company? Hmm? Say it again. <laughs> Those who want it. What does that do to wages? Profits go up. That's no fact. Remember, wages are not decided by profit. So this is a way to put money in the hands of the very wealthy. With the idea being that they'll come up with more efficient ways to produce, but they can also build a mansion too, couldn't they? Or as Miss Soybesson fished it in 1889 for a birthday party for a poodle, bought a $10,000 diamond necklace. And I mean $10,000 at that time. That's about $1.5 million today. It was a good dog, good pooch. But next, it was on the gold standard. And we're not going to go into the details of the complexities of the gold standard because they're part. It's really hard. But all major powers would go on this, this system called the gold standard by, by the 1870s, 1873 for the US. But it tied the value of dollars to gold. And since there is, there is a relatively finite amount of gold in, a, in the world, that means it's going to, by definition, create deflation. What that means is there's going to be, therefore, a limited amount of money in circulation. Therefore, what happens to the value of a dollar if there's deflation? The value of a dollar goes up. What happens to prices? It goes down. So inflation, the value of a dollar does what? Inflation. goes down, prices. If you're a worker or in debt, like let's say every single farmer, deflation kills you. Literally. I mean, this is the kind of thing that, that ends farms. And they're very anti-union. By using the troops and courts to stop labor unions, the government, state government, but also the national government, very anti-union. In fact, there, there, there has not been hardly any pro-union presidents. Roosevelt, Truman, Kennedy, Johnson. What is? Uh, unions raise wages. Not just for the workers in the union, but workers outside the union too. And that puts more money in the hands of the wealthy. Last thing I want to get today, I know the ball's about ready to rain, but also put down immigration. By opening up for immigration, that increases the size of the market, but also in a very narrow, narrow point, it can do what the wages. It can drop in a narrow point. So let's say all of a sudden you bring in a bunch of unstilled immigrants into an area. One area, like, like the coal mines. This happened here in West Virginia at the turn of the century to, to drive out the Union. And Ellis Island would be constructed in New York Harbor where millions of immigrants would come through. Remember, there's only one, one immigrant or immigrants from one country. They would not allow it. Remember what that was? 1884? Irish allowed in so. Chinese. And then 20 years later, it would be Japanese, and in 1924, it would be a research immigrant from everywhere except for Northern Europe. Racism. You know, they would say, there were some, there, there were a couple, you could say, economic issues about the major major, on the, on the, where it's free with the major countries to Europe. We don't want them to the idea was you flew with this with inferior race and play higher society. You two skipped yesterday.
I get it, it's airport. <laughs> Well, they're going like, I blame you. I was like, why do I Oh, we're filming all this.